2 Timothy chapter 3 in your Bibles this evening, and we'll continue our series on Thursday nights of stewarding our lives. And specifically tonight, it goes right along with what we just talked about Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and now Thursday evening, stewarding a testimony. Stewarding our testimony. As you find your place in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll look there in just a moment. Every Christian, every Christian, has a testimony. Mm -hmm. It's not just the story of when and where you're saved. That's typically what we refer to sometimes as our testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly part of it. But your testimony is the big picture of your life. Your message, your name, your reputation. The Bible clearly tells us that your testimony is of greater value than any material asset you may ever have. In fact, mm -hmm. Proverbs 22, 1 says this. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. In our uh, culture and society today, some buzzwords are identity and legacy. We want to shape our image so that it's favorable, so that it's lasting. We want others to remember us well. But for the Christian there's a larger concern regarding our identity, regarding our legacy, regarding our testimony, because as a Christian, watch this, it's his name and his reputation that we are living. Once you consider this uh, illustration, we'll have a word of prayer. There was a uh, commercial flight out of Denver, heavily uh, booked flight that near last moment was canceled. Just one single agent there at the desk trying to help uh, all these inconvenienced travelers get rebooked. Long line. And suddenly an angry passenger kind of pushed his way right to the front, slammed down his ticket and said, I have to be on this flight and it has to be first class. And the agent just kind of looked at him and said, I'm sorry, sir. I'll be happy to help you, but I'm going to take care of these folks first. There's a line. He was not happy. And he responded, do you have any idea who I am? Mm -hmm. Loud enough for folks behind even to hear. Without hesitating, the agent picked up her public address microphone and says, may I have your attention, please? She broadcast this throughout the terminal. We have a passenger here at the gate who does not know who he is. If anyone can help him find his identity, please come to the gate. <laughs> to which he hung his head and walked back to the line as everyone else cheered. <laughs> you see, as a Christian, the most important question in life is not, what do others think of me? Most important question in our lives is not, how will others remember me? The most important question in the life of a Christian is this. What do others know of Christ because of me? Amen. What do others know of Christ because of me now and after I'm gone? You see, what people think of me is irrelevant, but what they think of Christ is vital. And we have the opportunity, if you're a Christian here this evening, we have the opportunity to steward mm -hmm. our testimony in such a way that others now think highly of Christ. Amen. We're going to look at that this evening. I, I, this afternoon was studying through this and I just thought there's no reason to speed through it all. So I think we'll break it down into two weeks. But the first part, we may just cover our first point. Uh, when we get there, stewarding our testimony, not about me, it's all about him. Let's bow for prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, we enjoy their fellowship and singing and praying, especially this evening. We enjoy what's coming up, but now uh, we focus in on your word and we ask you to help us steward our testimony for you. Lord, we want to love God and love people. We want others to see you in us. Help us, give us wisdom in order to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our goal is to steward our reputation, our testimony, our lives, so that it honors the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It ought to be our goal to bring glory to him. Uh, if we were to look in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8, 
The Bible says better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Regardless of what your testimony has been to this point, we can all choose from here going forward to have a life, a testimony that exalts Jesus, that points others to him. But it has to be intentional. It's not going to happen by accident. In fact, if we just take our hands off and let what happens happens, we'll quickly see that the devil wants to uh, target and ruin our testimony. Mm -hmm. He knows an effective testimony and witness for the Lord is, is impactful in the lives of unbelievers. And so he wants to ruin your testimony. We're the keepers of it. We're to guard over our testimony. Before we even get, or this ties into 2 Timothy 3 here in just a moment, but I want us to think of one that perhaps had the greatest change in testimony in all of Scripture. I want you to think of the Apostle Paul. When we first met him, he's Saul. And we've seen the story of his life on Sunday nights as we've traveled through the book of Acts. We first meet him. He's a zealous, uh, zealous for the law, zealous for what he thinks is God, and a zealous persecutor of Christianity. He, he's an accomplice to the first martyr, Stephen. He ruthlessly quenches, attempts to quench the flames, the spreading flames of the early church. Uh -oh. Acts 8 3 says he made havoc of the church. Acts 9 1 saw yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord. He was intense in his testimony. And others knew it, didn't they? I mean, he had a reputation that went before him. And certainly went around him as well. But when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, everything changed. That's in Acts chapter 9. From that point forward, he then had a testimony that pointed people to Christ. Everywhere he went. Missionary work, missionary travels. Uh, we're now on his third, or he just finished his third missionary journey that we're looking at on, on Sunday evenings. And he... he quickly made himself a target of those that he had previously led. And so what, what do we see? He lived and breathed for Christ, for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. And after he planted all these churches, after he traveled nearing his end days on earth, he's in a, a cave-like uh, Mamertine prison in Rome. Nero had sentenced him to death, at which soon he would die. And it's there that he wrote one final New Testament epistle to Timothy, his second letter to Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy is the last writing of Paul before he died. And he's writing it to his close friend. Of the many pieces of counsel that he gives Timothy in these pages, he includes instructions on how to finish his life, on how to live with a testimony for the Lord. He knew his days were numbered. And so he wants to challenge Timothy to live for the Lord. And we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, look down in verse 10, he says this, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came upon unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord deliver me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I want us to consider Paul's life, and then specifically Timothy for a moment. I believe Timothy knew Paul perhaps greater than any other person. We see that in his travels. Paul mentioned Timothy. He traveled with Timothy. He poured his life into Timothy. And at the end of his life, 
Paul says this, Timothy, you know me. You have a clear picture of what my life was all about. You know that it's been real for God that I've genuinely lived for Christ. You discovered at times, often the closer you get to a person that you admire, the more disappointed you typically become. If you figure that out, you admire someone from afar and then you get to know them a little bit more and it's like, eh, they're not all they're cracked up to me. I've told you this story before. I remember, but I'll tell it again because it's about Kentucky basketball. So I enjoy talking about it. I was at a tournament game, sat right behind the bench, was given these tickets and a, a movie uh, starts. She still is in movies today, sat right here. She was nice. But on this side, comes down right after the game started, Scotty Pippen sits right beside me over here. The famous uh, basketball player played right alongside of Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen. That guy, I tell you, had to have been the meanest person I think I've ever met. He was just not happy. Just Maybe he had a bad day. I thought a lot about Scotty Pippen, but that day after I met him and from here on out, I had a different view completely when I was up close to him for two hours. Oftentimes, the closer you get to someone you admire, the more disappointed you come as you see different things. But in Timothy's relationship with Paul, I think the opposite was true. The closer he got, the more he saw. Paul lives for God. Even though he, I'm sure he saw the human weaknesses, which we're going to see one. It's it's kind of funny to me on Sunday night. You might read ahead. It's in Paul. It's in uh, Acts 23, but we'll see some of that later. But Timothy knew Paul had a genuine testimony for Christ. So here's the question that we're going to look at. How? How did Paul do it? How did he steward his testimony and live in such a way for decades sharing the gospel and live with the testimony that pointed people to Christ? I want us to look at this passage that we just read and see how we too can develop and steward our testimony. A testimony that honors God. Here's the first point tonight, and I think it's the only one we're going to get to. If you have your notes there uh, and want to want to fill it in, here it is. The first one, we must build on the truth. Are we going to steward our testimony? First and foremost, we have to build on the truth. Now, after you write that down, you want to look right back up here. When you think of establishing a good testimony, if you're like me, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is, your actions, what you do. If I'm going to steward a testimony, I need to work on what I do. But that's not where Paul started. He started a little bit deeper. When he speaks of his testimony to Timothy, his first words about his testimony were in what he believed. Before he mentioned any action, before he mentioned any habits, he referred to the basis for his actions, his belief system. Look at it again in verse number 10. He says, but thou hast fully known my, what? Doctrine. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. That word doctrine is what we believe, what we embrace as truth. Think about it for a moment. You realize what you do is a result of what you believe? Everything you do is a result of what you believe. It's our beliefs that determine our actions. Well, let's think about it in a financial way. If we believe that a particular investment will pay dividends, we'll invest our money in it. If we believe that junk food will shorten our quality of life, then we'll avoid it. Until we realize it's not worth it. We're going to die anyway. No, <laughs> should have gone there. If we believe this is something that is true, then what's going to happen? We're going to act upon that. We can say we believe something, but our actions just tell us what our true beliefs are. As Paul prepares Timothy, his son in the faith, for ministry. And by the way, do you know where Timothy pastors? The church at... Ephesus, where we're at on Sunday morning. See, this all kind of ties together. This is neat. He warned him that, hey, Timothy, there's going to be people that don't embrace sound doctrine. In fact, 
You're there in chapter 3. Turn over to chapter 4 and look what he says in verse number 3. Maybe on the same page for you. Chapter 4 verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I tell you, those two verses perfectly describe our culture today, don't they? In, in a nominal Christianity world, people are willing to be entertained, even in church, because they don't want doctrine to intrude on their lifestyle and their daily choices. Often they're willing to listen to teachers who echo culture, popular culture, but not to those who give Bible truth that necessitate, necessitates a response. Of change. Don't don't meddle in something that may have may mean I have to change something. If that's true, that I have to live this way, I don't want to go that way. Tell me what I want to hear. Our lives must be built upon the truth if we're going to steward our testimony correctly. What does that mean? We'll look at two things, and we'll be finished this evening. First of all, it must be built on the doctrine of the scriptures. The doctrine of the scriptures. Because our beliefs dictate our behavior, the substance of our beliefs is paramount. If I'm going to have a testimony that honors God, I've got to begin by letting the truth of God's word permeate my life. Let me say it again. If I'm going to have a testimony that honors God, I must let his word permeate. That means go all throughout my life. Christians today, if they're not careful, we'll talk a little bit about this on Sunday morning as well. Christians downplay the importance of doctrine. Look right here. Look right here, everybody. They downplay the importance of doctrine. I'm just going to focus on the practical. I don't, I'm going to stick my head in the sand as regards to theological. I'm just going to make sure I love Jesus. Hold on. Be careful. That may sound okay, but the Bible tells us that's dangerous. Because I cannot maintain a pure, a godly testimony if I'm not grounded in the truth of what God's word says. If I downplay doctrine, oftentimes I'll be the first to adapt my life to the culture. But if I want to desire, if I desire to build my life to shape my testimony on the truths of God's word, I have no choice but to immerse myself in scripture, mm -hmm. to saturate my heart, my mind with God's truth. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens when we do that? When we saturate our hearts, our minds with the truth of God, we'll find that it's applicable for right now, that it's a living book, mm -hmm. that it applies to our culture, our society, our job, our family today. In fact, look at it. We stopped in verse number 16 of chapter 3. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That, that word inspiration means God breathed. The word profitable, you know what that means? It's beneficial. It's helpful. If all I do is talk about the Bible, but I don't act upon the Bible, then I'm missing the greatest source of personal gain for a Christian. Let me say that again. I think all of us would say easily, yes, I believe the Bible. Yes, we ought to live by the Bible. But do we do it? Because if all we do is give it lip service and we don't allow it to change our lives, we're missing the greatest source of personal gain for a Christian. His word. It teaches us it's profitable to us. And, and it even shows us what it's profitable for. Did you see it? It's profitable for doctrine. That's the truth. It's profitable for reproof. That's correcting us when we get away. So God's word is profitable to show us what's right. It's profitable to show us when we go wrong. It's profitable for correction. That, that's instructing us how to get back in line with the truth. So it shows us what the truth is. It shows us when we're not in the truth. It shows us how to get back in line with the truth. 
And then it says for instruction in righteousness. Now it's given me directions to live the truth and enjoy the, its benefits. Amen. Did you catch all that? That's how much profitable God's word is. When I live by it, not just say it, not just say I believe it and set it aside and might read it a little bit before church. But when I'm in it throughout, I can see that this shows me what's right. This shows me, ooh, that wasn't right. This shows me, okay, we need to get it right. This shows me, now I can live right. That's his word. And if I'm going to steward my testimony, hear me, if I'm going to steward my testimony for Christ, it must be built on the truth. The doctrine of the scriptures. We nurture a hunger for God's word, sustain a commitment to daily apply it. Second of all, not just the doctrine of the scriptures, but that's going to lead ultimately to the doctrine of the Savior. The doctrine of the Savior. If I form a foundation of belief on God's word, then without a doubt, I will embrace the true doctrine of the Savior. And this is so very important. You know what separates this church from other churches at times? There are some who don't preach who Jesus is. It's not about who we think Jesus is. It's not about who we want Jesus to be. It's about what God's word says Jesus is. And the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is God. Not some good, you know, I've heard this so many times. I was born and raised in church. I say it, I say it almost jokingly. I was, I was raised on drugs. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night from the time I was a baby. I've been in church so many times. So, and I've heard Jesus is God. What's the big deal? Because it is a big deal. And a lot of people don't really believe that Jesus was God. He was a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a great example. He wasn't God. Careful. John 10, 30. I and my father are one. Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 1 Timothy 3, 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. We could go on and on. I want us to see that uh, in regards to the doctrine of the Savior, that first of all, Jesus is the creator of the world. He's the creator of the world. Well, hold on a minute. In the beginning, God created. Yes. Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. That him in Colossians 1 is referring to Jesus, the son, not the father. He is God. He is the creator of the world. Second of all, Jesus, oh, this one's huge. Jesus received worship. Think about it for a moment. He received worship as God. You know, there are many times when angels would appear to people in scripture and immediately those people would bow down to those angels. What was the first thing those angels would say? Get up. You ain't worshiping me. Uh-uh, I'm not God. I'm an angel. I'm a messenger. Here's a message. Yeah. But you know what happened when people worshiped Jesus when he was on earth? He did not say, get up. John 10, 28, Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. He received worship as God. We're going quickly through these, but all of them are important and we'll be finished. Third of all, to know the doctrine of the Savior that he is God, Jesus forgave sin as only God can do. When Jesus saw their faith, Mark 2, 5, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He's the creator of the world. He received worship. He forgave sin and he is unchanging, immutable like God. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8, the same yesterday and today and forever. So as we close this evening, hasn't been nearly as long, a little shorter message tonight, but we're not going to jump through all of what points two and three have for us. But we're, we're, we're dealing with the most important part. We're laying the foundation. How can you and I steward our testimony in such a way that others see Christ? First and foremost, we must build on the truth. Amen. Build on the truth. What? The doctrine of the scripture. The doctrine of the savior. When I believe the truth about Jesus Christ. Then I know that I can trust him. I can trust him in this life. Well, watch this. I can trust him with eternal life. That's right. Because he's always the same. 
Before we close tonight, do you know Jesus? Oh, I'm not talking about do you know him? Because I, I would fair, venture to say everyone in Orland knows Jesus. But I'm not asking do you know him? Do you know him? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Do you not know about him? But is he your Lord and Savior? Have you realized that your sin, my sin, sends us to hell? God doesn't. My sin does. I can't be with God forever because of my sin. That's the whole reason Jesus came and lived in the flesh 100% God. And still, while he's 100% man, had no sin, went to the cross to die for your sin and for my sin. He paid the payment so that I don't have to. But now I have a choice. I try to earn it myself. The only way I can do that is in eternity in hell. Or I can trust his payment, turn away from my sin, turn to Christ, ask forgiveness for my sin, ask Jesus to come and live on the side of my heart forever. And he says, I, I will. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, Jesus said, but by me. How in the world, Christian, can you trust him for eternal life, but not for this life? I'll tell you how, because you don't really know him. But the more that we know him, the closer we get to him, the more we build upon the truth of his word and come to know him personally day in and day out, oh, it's easy then to throw our hands up and trust God and leave it to him. Let's steward our testimony. How? First and foremost, build upon the truth. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this evening. Thank you for listening.